glad morning when this life is over I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore I'll fly away I'll fly away oh glory I'll fly away Many 
People passed me by as I sat there in the way, begging just to get through another day. I could not walk in this way for such a long, long time. I thought this would be the way I'd always be. Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give unto thee. Rise up and walk in the name of the Lord. Then one day, just as before, the many people passed me by. I cried out for mercy, for I was in despair. Then it happened, I don't know just how, but it happened, I was made whole, as the man said unto me. Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give unto thee. up from my bed running around praising my Lord it was hard to believe I've been made whole these legs have been so twisted never could move yes it sure is a miracle I now can walk around Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give unto thee. Rise up and walk in the name of the Lord. Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give unto thee. Rise up and I say rise up and walk in the name of the Lord. Will I want to live the way he wants me to live? I want to be until there's just no more to give I want to love, love Till there's just no more love For I could never, ever out love the Oh uh -huh.
Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of standing here once again in this place, Lord, that's been consecrated to your worship. Lord, with brothers and sisters, Lord, who come with the same desire just to bring honor and glory to your name, to hear your word, Lord, and to reverence it, to surrender to it. God, I pray, Lord, that you'd come on the scene according to your promise, for you said whether two or three are gathered. Lord, so we know that you're here because you've never lied. You've never told us anything wrong. But we're here gathered in your name, Lord. Not our name, but your name. Not just for our purpose, but for your purpose. Not just for our desire, though we desire. But we're here by your bidding, by your drawing, because of your desire. May everything we say or do bring glory and honor to your name, Lord. God, I pray that you would feed us, Lord. God, there's nothing, Lord, that we can do in of ourselves. But God, if we can yield ourselves to you, then you can do beyond our ability. And that's what we're depending on, that by your spirit, you would do beyond our ability. That you would take, Lord, a vessel of clay and you would use it to speak eternal words of life. That those words will go in deep inside of our hearts and change us, Lord. And that word would be a seed that would be planted in good ground and it would bring forth a bountiful harvest for your glory. May it be so in our lives. We ask in Jesus Christ's name, speak tonight, Lord, we pray. Take the preeminence as we surrender it to you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen, God bless you. You can be seated for just a moment. Thank you, musicians, God bless you. Amen. I just want to say we had a wonderful wedding here last night. and 
So thankful for all who could attend. We had many visitors. Some have had to leave, but some have remained. Sister Irina's brother and his wife and daughter are here. God bless you. It's good to have you with us. I was glad they were able to stay over. Many have already had to travel back. But uh, I just want to thank everybody who helped make it such a nice wedding, such a memorable wedding. And we really are thankful for Brother Riley and Sister Abigail Sanders. That's what we can say now. That, that's her name now. She's had a name change by marriage, amen, and so we, we thank God. When she signed the marriage certificate, I saw her sign Baumgartner for the very last time she'll ever sign Baumgartner. So may God bless them as they're away and bless them in their travels. Uh, also wanted to say thank you all for praying for us as we were gone last weekend celebrating my wife's parents' 50th wedding anniversary. We had a nice time. We had good travels there. And, and all of the family was gathered together for the first time in a long, long time so that everybody made it. So it was nice, so we appreciate that. So I wasn't here to formally welcome our visitors from UK. So Brother Simon had to do it himself. But God bless you, Brother Simon. It's good to have you and your family here. So nice to have you back once again. And we really appreciate Brother Simon stepping in and taking the service for us. And we were able to stream while we were driving up from West Virginia and we got to stream the entire service and loved every minute of it. I thought it was a wonderful word from the Lord, and it was exciting to hear. And we were in the van saying, amen, that's good, praise the Lord. And then he was doing stuff on the whiteboard I never knew you could do. <laughs> and then they were watching behind, they were streaming, they had the, the phone behind me, so I couldn't see what he was doing. I was driving, and, and he goes, I'll zoom this in here. I said, you can zoom the whiteboard? <laughs> I said, did he just zoom that? So I told Brother Simon yesterday he's going to have to give me instructions, a training session on how to use the whiteboard that I've been using for more than a year. So God bless you, Brother Simon. We appreciate you yielding to the Lord. It was a wonderful word, and we certainly enjoyed it. Amen. Uh, also, want to remind you, tomorrow night will be the uh, Church Age Book Bible Study here in the Fellowship Hall. It'll be the last one we'll be having for a month because we'll be traveling. Uh, my daughters and I will be traveling to Australia to minister, so... Uh, we just want to remind you of that. Let's, let's all stand together and let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. And then Romans chapter 8, and I'd like to read just two verses, verse 17 and verse 18. Romans chapter 8. Verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I mean, God bless you as you have your seats. I want to take from this, from this text uh, a thought that I'd like to share with you. And for a title, we can take The Resolve to Suffer. And The Resolve to Suffer. And we've, we've preached around on this subject many times. You can't preach the Christian life without preaching suffering or trials or tribulations. And so we've touched on this many times, but there's a certain aspect that I would like to just highlight, and that's the resolve to suffer. Uh, we find so many times that what really troubles us in trials and tribulations what really, I believe, causes us so much distress and turmoil is all of our efforts to avoid trials. And we spend and exhaust and exert so much energy and so men much mental strain in our avoidance of what will come, what will come anyways, instead of just being resolved to suffer. So I believe that we could spare ourselves so much mental strain and tribulation and trouble if we would just be resolved that this is a principle in the Christian life and we're just gonna be resolved to it. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter two. 2 Timothy chapter two. And I'm gonna read from uh, verse 10. 2 Th Timothy chapter two, verse 10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. So if we suffer, we shall reign. 
And what he said before in Romans is that, uh, that we're joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So there's no option on suffering. Suffering's just part of the package. Uh, let's turn to Philippians now, Philippians chapter four. Philippians chapter four and verse 10. In Philippians chapter four, verse 10, it reads, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. He's talking about meeting a financial need that he has. Now he says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That's the key phrase. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. He knew how to do with much and he knew how to do with little, how to abound and how to abase. Amen. He was thanking them for meeting the financial need, but not that he had want because he knew that in whatever state he was in there and to be content, he had learned that, amen, to, to suffer with whatever God had allowed and that with, with God, uh, he can do all things through Christ which strengthened him. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians now because we're picking this all up from the Apostle Paul and let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12 and verse seven. He says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that were given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, or there, I'm sorry, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong." I marveled when he says this because we know the Apostle Paul did not want or desire this affliction. Whatever the thorn was in his flesh wasn't something he was pleased with, took pleasure in or wanted because he sought the Lord thrice to take it away. So Paul's desire was not to have whatever this affliction was, he didn't want it. It came upon him without him asking for it. It was given to him. It was a, a messenger of Satan to buffet him, permitted by God. He didn't want it. He didn't want it to remain. He was asking God for it to be removed. And he asked three times. And finally, the word of the Lord came to him and said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And when he got that answer, I want you to watch his attitude because what we're talking about tonight is an attitude. It, we, we're going to talk about suffering, but it's not about suffering. Everybody suffers. Everybody that's been born of a woman suffers. Everybody that's taken breath in and out in this world suffers to one degree or another. Suffering is not, suffering is not just uh, only reserved for Christians. Suffering is reserved for humanity. But what I want to talk about is our attitude. When he found out that God had permitted this and wasn't intended to remove it and said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, he says, most gladly, therefore, will, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. What a statement. Amen. That's not what he was saying before he got the word of the Lord. He was asking for it to be removed. He wasn't taking pleasure in the infirmities. But once he realized this is the will of God, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness, he says, now I will take pleasure in infirmities, that the, uh, in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. Praise God. So I love the attitude and that's what I want us to key in on because this is what separates Christians from the rest of the world. Amen. In Uniting Time and Signs, Brother Bram says, speaking of tension, 
I was praying about it this morning. What would you do if you didn't have tension? And we know Brother Bram was plagued with this tension, this nervousness, this tension he had from a small boy, and it troubled him all the time. Everybody knew he had this tension. His mother knew it. And, and, but he, he, he was praying about it the morning he was preaching this sermon. He said, what would you do if, if you didn't have tension? Just think of it. Tension is a part of living. That kind of encouraged me when I thought that. If you had no tension, you'd be like a rag doll. You wouldn't have no feelings. There'd be nothing you could work on. A little further down, he says, and just think of feelings. What if you didn't have any feelings, no pains or nothing? What if there'd be no pain at all? You'd have no feelings at all. Just think, just think for a minute of how much of human existence and how much human effort is directed towards the avoidance of pain. How much money, how much time, how much effort do we spend trying to avoid pain? I don't, know, I don't know if we could put a monetary value on it or we can give an allotment of time, but I've spent a great deal of my time trying to avoid pain, trying to bypass it, trying to not suffer. But Brother Ben said, what if you didn't have any pain? You'd have no feelings at all. And if you had no feeling, then one of your senses would be gone, see? So everything's just right anyhow. God just give us grace to stand up to it. That's the thing. If I just stand up with that grace and stand there and say, we know that when this life is over, the great one's on the other side where we're looking to go to. And now we remember that all these things, that's a tension. Some people tries to introduce Christianity that you're free from worry. No, you're not. You're free from tension. Oh no, you add tension when you become a Christian because you was kind of happy-go-lucky, whatever it was out there, not caring what you did. But when you've become a real Christian, every moment you're wondering, am I pleasing my Lord? If I could hear from him, it puts you on tension, puts you on guard. That's what makes you what you are. So after all, tension is a blessing. Those of you who service, suffer with nervous tension, it's a blessing. Amen. And it's caused, I, I'm sure it's caused a lot of trouble. Nervousness and tension causes trouble, causes distress, causes anguish. But the prophet of God saying, it's a blessing. It's just the way you're looking at it. It's just the way you're looking at it. See, if you just look the other side, no matter how thin you slice anything, you still got two sides to it. See, so you want to see both sides. Tension, what, what's this Tension. If I could have been born without this tension, well, if I wouldn't have had this tension, I wouldn't have been what I am. I wouldn't have been a Christian, perhaps. It was this tension that drove me to Jesus Christ. See, so it's been a blessing thing to me. See what I said about attitude? He says, it's just the way you look at it. Every situation in life has two sides to it, and it just depends on the way we look at the situation. And all of us are gonna face situations. We have faced, we probably are facing, we will be facing situations, situations that causes anxiety, situations that cause tension, situations that cause pain or suffering, and everything comes down to the way we view that situation is going to determine the way we behave towards that situation. He goes on in this quote to say, so then as Paul said, as though when he had tension or something or another, he had consulted the Lord to take it away from him three times. And the Lord said uh, to my Paul, he said, my grace is sufficient. He said, then I'll glory in my infirmities. Then when I am weak, I am strong. As long as it's the will of God, all right. Now I consulted him one time when it used to bother me so bad it scared me. And he told me about eight or 10 years ago, he said, it'll never scare you again, and it never has did it. No, sir, don't worry about it. I just feel it, but I know it's there, but I just go on because it, it don't scare me no more. So thankful for that. Now, listen to what he says next. Now, he could have said it won't be no more, just as well as that it won't scare you no more. He was praying about it because it used, it, it, you know, <clears throat> it used to scare him. You say, what would scare you about this nervous tension? Well, maybe it would scare him that he was losing control. 
Maybe he was fearful that he didn't know how bad it would get. He, he had to leave the field. He left the ministry one time because of a nervous breakdown. Maybe he was fearful that he didn't know how far this tension would go and how bad it would get. And it used to scare him and he sought the Lord. And the Lord one time said, it won't scare you no more. He could have just as easily taken the tension away. If he took the fear away, he could take the tension away. But somehow the tension served God's purpose. So he took the fear away, not the tension. And then the next thing he said, so it's his will that it happened. So I just embrace it and say, thank you, Lord. I'll walk that way. Hmm. I'm going to say that again because it does something to me. So it's his will that it happened. So I'll just embrace it and say, thank you, Lord. I'll walk that way. The one thing that we always try to do in life is get rid of our trials, not embrace them. But sometimes the only thing to do is embrace them because it's the will of God. I want to look at Mark 14 together. Let's look at Mark 14, and let's go to verse 32. Mark 14 and verse 32. And they came to a place which was called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death tarry you here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. Here Jesus comes to the hour, the hour of his great trial, the hour of his suffering, the hour of his persecution. And when he comes, his soul was exceedingly sorrowful unto death. He was under great agony and sorely amazed. And Jesus wasn't looking forward to the trial in his flesh. He didn't want it. I hope you can understand what I'm saying. He didn't want it. He wanted to bypass it. So as a human being, as a man, he wanted to go around this obstacle. And he said, Father, if there's any way that this can pass me. But then he says, but not my will, but thine. So he continually surrenders. We know he does this three times, but he surrenders to the will of God. But what he would like to do is bypass this hour. He would like to bypass this trial. He is a man. Brother Bam said he was 100% man, 100% God. Now, when you figure it out mathematically, when you can solve that equation, come and talk to me. But it's nonetheless absolutely true. He was 100% man. He was 100% God. And as a man, he wanted to bypass. He was already suffering with the, the mental anguish, the emotional anguish of what was laying ahead of him was causing him to be sorely amazed and be in anguish, in severe anguish. So this wasn't, this wasn't a, an easy thing. This wasn't an easy trial. And he, and, he, and he sought the Father that if it were possible. And, and he starts off by saying, Father, all things are possible to you. Have you ever prayed that? Have you ever been in the middle, middle of a trial and said, God, you could so easily. God, this is nothing for you. You could so easily. Amen. You remove devils by the finger of God. I mean, you could so easily get me out of this situation. You could rescue me. This whole situation could change tomorrow. Have you ever prayed that way? Well, you're praying just like Jesus prayed. Abba, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. That's what he says. Take away this. God, you can do anything. Take this away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will but thou wilt. And he cometh and he findeth them sleeping and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray lest you enter in temptation. The spirit is truly ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. 
And he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now. Something had changed. After the third time, there was a resolve. I could say there was a resolve in him to suffer. He had sought the Lord. He had asked if it was possible to be bypassed. He had gotten the word from the Lord. Three times he had asked the Father if he could bypass this trial. And three times there was no no yes answer. And each time he was willing to surrender to the will of God. And each time the, the, the answer never changed. And finally he comes back and he says, sleep on now. And take your rest. It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. There's something about that statement that amazes me. Just before he's in great sore amazement and great anguish and sorrow, And he's seeking the almighty God, the Father who can take away every circumstance and change everything and asking him to remove this cup from him. But then surrendering his will to the Father's will. And even in another gospel, he comes and he talks to his disciples and he he expresses disappointment. He says, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Don't you know what I'm going through? Don't you know what's happening? Can you not just bear with me? Couldn't you just be a friend to me? Could you not watch with me one hour? How many times do you get in a trial and for you, it's the greatest trial of your life, but for your friends, it's not a big deal. They don't understand the anguish. They don't understand the the tension. They don't understand what you're going through. And you feel all alone and all forsaken. You're asking God to change the situation and it doesn't look like the situation's gonna change. And he was, went from sorely amazed and in great anguish and disappointed in his friends for not watching with him one hour. And he goes through all of these emotions and then he finally comes to a resolve. And when he comes to the resolve, to me it's beautiful. Sleep on now and take your rest. Before he says, why couldn't you watch? Why are you asleep? What are you doing sleeping? Why can't you watch with me? I need you to pray with me. And now he says, it's okay, take your rest. It's all settled. I know the will of God. Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed in the hand. Hey, hey, listen, there, there is no doubt in his mind what's getting ready to happen. He understands the situation. This isn't ignorance, blissful ignorance that he's moving into, not knowing. He knows exactly where this is going. He knows where this is going to lead. He knows exactly what's taking place, but he's got such a resolve and such a peace and such a stability because now he's stepping into the will of Father. He has surrendered his will. He said, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. One of the things I love about this is when Jesus comes to this resolve, from anguish and sorrow to disappointment and friends and calling out to God to resolve, now this resolve carries him right through the the worst trial, the most difficult set of circumstances a human being can go through. He is betrayed. He is he is. He is rejected and he is forsaken. Then he is uh, uh, mocked, he is scourged, he is falsely accused, he is beaten, he is uh, uh, nailed to a cross and he's left to die. Like the trial, this isn't like losing your job. This isn't like your spouse, you know, saying something cruel and mean to you and hurting your feet. We're at a whole new level here. But the resolve carries him through the trial and the way he conducts himself as he moves forward with the resolve to suffer, to me, is is paramount. To me, it's our goal. This is what we're striving for. Amen. It's not that we don't have emotion. Jesus, it wasn't that he didn't have emotion. He wasn't sterile. He was 100% man. Amen. He felt. Amen. He suffered. He had anguish. He had sorrow. Amen. He, He did not want to suffer. He did not want to go through the trial. He did not want to feel the pain. 
He did not want to separate one from his friends. He knew all the feelings that we feel. But yet, when he knew the will of God and he resolved himself to do the will of God, he was able to walk into suffering, amen, and as a lamb si- silent before the slay, before, before the slaughter, and a sheep silent before the shears, he was able to go dumb because he had already resolved. He didn't have to defend himself. He didn't have to, I mean, he didn't say anything mean to Judas. What would we have said? If we knew what Judas has done and he come, all he said was, Judas, betray us, the son of man, with a kiss? When he stood, uh, when he stood in the, the trial, and, and the whole trial was, was, was a total sham. He didn't defend himself. He didn't try to get out of it. He didn't. He just stood and let them say what they were going to say. He didn't defend himself because he knew the will of God. And even when when Pilate says, no, you not that I have the power, he says, you have no power. This is given to you from heaven, from above. He knew what was going on, that God was in charge, but the resolve to suffer, amen, brought out such a beautiful character, amen, that he didn't have to panic. He didn't have to be afraid. He didn't have to defend himself. He didn't have to become angry or bitter or any of the things that happen to us when we get into a situation that's not near as intense as this. Why? Because he was resolved to suffer. The prophet of God tells us in the church age book, in the Smyrna church age, he reads Hebrews 5 and 8. Five, uh, chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. It says, Though were he, he were a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. In plain language, the very character of Jesus was perfected by suffering. Did you, did you get the impact of what Brother Bram just said? The character of Jesus was perfected by suffering. I didn't know that his character needed perfecting. But he said the very character of Jesus was perfected by suffering. And if his character was perfected by suffering, how is our character going to be perfected? The very character of Jesus was perfected by suffering. And according to Paul, he has left his church a measuring of suffering and they too, by their faith in God while suffering for him, would come to a place of perfection. He goes on to say, unless we suffer with him, we cannot reign with him. You have to suffer to reign. The reason for this is that character simply is never made without suffering. Character is a victory, not a gift. A man without character can't reign because power apart from character is satanic. But power with character is fit to rule. And since he wants us to share even his throne on the same basis that he overcame and is set down on his father's throne, then we have to overcome to sit with him. And the little temporary sufferings we go through now is not worthy to be compared to the tremendous glory that will be revealed in us when he comes. Oh, what treasures are laid up for those who are willing to enter into his kingdom through much tribulation. Then he quotes from Peter. He says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials that are to try you. That is what Peter said. Is it strange that God wants to develop a Christ-like character that comes through suffering? No, sir, and we all have trials. We are all tried and chastened as sons. Not one, but goes through that. He says, is it strange that God wants to develop Christ-like character? Why are these things happening to us? Is it strange that he wants to? If, if Jesus Christ's character was perfected by suffering, is it strange that we would have trials and tribulations? We shouldn't think it's strange. But the, the, re, the reality is, We always think it's strange. We always think it's somehow unfitting, unfair, undeserved. And that may not be you. You may have risen to a higher level of maturity, but God's still working on me because every time I go into, why, God, is this happening? And why why am I suffering? And why did you let this happen? And why didn't you prevent this? And you could have stopped this. And why is that going on? And why is this going on? Why, 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 why? And then really, I find, for me, I find so many times that when, when it comes to the trials and tribulations of life, and listen, I don't mean just trials and tribulations because we're being persecuted for the gospel's sake. Amen. There's a whole lot of other trials and tribulations that are shaping us in life. 
But the trials and tribulations of life, I find that so many times I cause myself way more mental stress and strain than the actual trial would cause me. By trying to fight the very fact that it's happening and resist it and, and uh, try to find a, a mechanism with which I can avoid it and trying to find my own way out and, and trying to dodge the bullet as it was to say, amen. It, it reminds me of when I was in school, you know, when I was in school, I get assigned a research paper. You got a five page research paper. That is the trial of my life. And I would do anything but sit down and write that paper. I would think, I've got to go to the library first, so I'll wait till I go to the library. Go to the library. I've got to get books. Well, i got the books. I know nobody goes to the library anymore. But that's what we used to have to do. <laughs> oh, I'll read this book and I'll read that book. Okay, well, I'll start writing, but I've got to write an outline first. Well, I... I and you just kick the can down the road and you find some excuse and you don't do it and you delay it and there you are the night before and you gotta write a five page uh, research paper, amen? And so if you finally just sit down and you just start writing. You know what always happens? By the time you actually sit down to write it and get done, it really wasn't that bad. It really wasn't a big deal. I caused myself weeks of stress, weeks of strain, weeks of mental anguish, dreading writing this paper, dreading all the things I'm going to, the hours of anguish of finding another one. And the fact is when I sat down to write it, you just start flowing and it works and one thought builds to another. And before you know, you're done writing the paper. And if I would have wrote it the day it was assigned, I would have had it done way ahead of time. I would have passed through that trial. I wouldn't have complained. I wouldn't have become bitter. I wouldn't have accused the teacher of being mean and rude and a hateful teacher and not liking the students and wishing I was in Mrs. So-and-so's class, you know. How much mental, I mean, this is a childish example, but this example matches everything in life. Take it to work, take it to family, bring it into the church. Amen. We cause ourselves all the trouble because we're not just resolved to pass through a trial. And then before you know it, God doesn't like you because you're in Mr. So-and-so's class and not Mrs. So-and-so's class. And it never works out for me and it always works out for other people. And before you know it, you've got God off the throne and forgot where you're at and he's not in control anymore. Everybody around you now is in control. The problem is when we don't just resolve ourselves to suffer and move the way God wants us to move, then all of a sudden we bring God off of the throne, we put him down here, and now Pilate's the one in control of this. Now it's everybody else around me. It's Mr. This Teacher in this school and the Ohio State for requiring a curriculum that be so foolish. And I remember I missed recess for a whole week because I couldn't finish my multiplication tables. Oh, the burden that sometimes we suffer through. <laughs> I had to get my one, two, one through 10 multiplication tables memorized and filled out and I didn't get it done in time. And listen, it wasn't because I wasn't capable. It wasn't because I couldn't do it. It wasn't because I couldn't memorize. It wasn't because I didn't understand the concept. It was because I just didn't want to do it. Because it was going to take a little bit of mental strain. It was going to take a little bit of application, applying myself. And I was going to actually have to not play until 10 o'clock at night. I was actually going to have to sit down and like, like, like memorize it. And I didn't want to because I didn't like it. And then all the kids go out to recess. And then I can see him running by. We had a lower floor and the window was up high and I could see feet moving by. And all of a sudden, the disdain for my teacher. <laughs> and my hatred for math in general. The problem is when we take that in later in life, we start to attach that to people. This person who hurt me, yeah. my dad, my mom, that brother, my boss. Yeah. Who gave you your mother and your father? Yeah. Who gave you your job? Yeah. Who foresaw your trials? Yeah. Who knows what character he's molding? Yeah. Yeah. 
And who knows what he's trying to draw out of the seed that's inside of you. Question is, is God still on the throne? Is everybody else in control? Does God still know and ordain the footsteps of the righteous? Or, or is it just a haphazard random life and everybody else can do me wrong anytime and, and throw, throw the course off and mess up God's plan and ruin everything? We can't have it both ways. It's either one or the other. And so you can see how not resolving to suffer, all of a sudden it creates in us extra anguish and extra turmoil. Listen, if I would have took the assignment and studied my multiplication tables, I was more than capable of memorizing them in short order. I could have filled it out when all the other kids filled it out, and I could have went to recess when everybody else went to recess, and I wouldn't have had to struggle with bitterness. I wouldn't have had to fight off self-pity. You know the reason I use multiplication tables? And because if I start using real examples that we all face with on a daily basis, some of you are going to get offended at me. So I've got to use multiplication tables and research papers because this hits way too close to home. Because it becomes, my, it becomes my husband, it becomes my wife, it becomes the minister, it becomes the Sunday school teacher, it becomes my coworker, it becomes my boss. And instead of saying, God, can you let this trial pass me? But if not, thy will be done. And just give me the grace to stand up to it. Remember, Brother Bram talked about when the slave buyer was going down the south and he was looking for slaves and he come across this one and, and he saw a young man in the field and that young man, he, he held his head high, he kind of had an air of dignity about him, he went all of his work and he never had to be persuaded, he never had to be beat, he never, he, he just did it and he started asking about him and, 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 and the owner began to sing his accolades and, you know, never have to whip him, never have to do anything and, and he wanted to buy him. He said, he's not for sale. And he began to ask, what, what is it that makes him so different? Do you treat him different? No, he treats the same. Eat different? No, he eat, eats, eats the same. And he found out that in his homeland, his father was the, was the king of a tribe. And though he's away from home, he conducts himself as the son of a king. Brother Man brought that lesson. He told it so many times. It's such a simple lesson. But the reality should be true for us every day. Amen. Why should I bring myself down to grovel, to complain, to become bitter and disappointed in life when my father is the king? And actually, my father sent me on this journey because he wants me to rule and reign with him one day. And so he wants me to gain some character so that he can bring me back to the throne and be a joint heir with him. Amen. The whole thing is serving a purpose, a great purpose. And it all has to do with me being exalted on high and placed on a throne with the character fit to rule. Nothing bad is happening to me. That's why the message of the hour and the end time is so beautiful that it absolutely, it, it peels back, amen, all the confusion of our life. It takes the seals of our life so we can see where we came from, why we're here, where we're going, and what the purpose is in our life so that we can begin to conduct ourselves as children of the king. We, we eat what everybody else in the world eats. We sleep where everybody else in the world sleeps. We get treated like everybody else in the world gets treated, but we should conduct ourselves completely different than everybody else. We are sold into the slavery of hybridization like every other slave that's on this planet. But we should conduct ourselves differently. Let's go to Genesis 37 together. Genesis 37. And verse 26. Genesis 37. And verse 26. We're going to look at the life of Joseph just with a few scriptures. Genesis 37 and 26. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. So here they're going to take their little brother, who they hate because he's spiritual, 
He's done nothing wrong. He's done nothing wrong to them. He's done nothing wrong. But because they're jealous and they have envy and they hate him, they're going to take him and they're going to sell him into slavery. Now, I've never been treated like this. But I can tell you if I had, there would be a lot of things going on in my emotional realm. I've never been betrayed the way Jesus has been betrayed. But if I had, there would be a lot of things going on in my emotional realm. It would set up a struggle. It would set up a struggle that was beyond the slavery. Because being sold into slavery has one struggle. But being in torment and turmoil in your mind is something completely different. Genesis 39, verse 1. Genesis 39 and 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from that time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. There's something that I draw out of this when I look at this in context of what we're talking about. Joseph, having done nothing wrong, he's hated and betrayed by his brethren. He's despised for no good reason because he's, he is what God made him. He's sold into slavery. When he's sold into slavery, he goes down. And, and while he's down there, he's, he's bought by Potiphar. Now he's Potiphar's property. And we, we know all of this. But something is unusual here because he must conduct himself in an unusual way. Because Potiphar sees something in Joseph that's special. I don't think Joseph was angry, contemptuous, and bitter. I don't think Potiphar would have made him ruler of his house. I don't think he was sour and contrary. I don't think he was depressed and downgraded to the point of not speaking. No doubt he was upset. No doubt he had all, all the emotions that we would go through, but there was something different about Joseph and that Joseph in this situation, he was able to project another kind of life and the life he kind of tried to project caused Potiphar to take note of him and Potiphar took him and began to give him authority and began to give him uh, uh, different, different uh, rulership over different things until finally Joseph ruled everything that was in his house and he didn't even know what he had coming or going, only the, what he sat down to eat, he knew he had that. Everything else was in Joseph's hands. Yes, Amen. I, I, I'm, I'm just believe with all my heart. There's no way Joseph could have got there sour and bitter and nasty and angry and blaming everybody else for his problems. No way. No way he could operate at that level. Amen. He was operating at a totally different level. So that situation is bad enough because he's taken from his father, he's taken from his family, he's taken from the land that he's promised, amen, now he's in slavery, but the situation goes from bad to worse. So 39, 19, and it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, why? Because Potiphar's wife tried to have Joseph for herself and he fled. And it came to pass when his master heard the words of the wife, which she spoke unto him, saying, after this manner did the servant to me, that his wrath was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. My. Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. So when the trial gets worse, it wasn't like Joseph could endure for so long, but now there's no way I can take this, Lord. You've given me too much. 
This trial has gone beyond my ability. This is, this is over the top. This is not right. There's no way. And, and no, there must have been something that carried Joseph through because when he got down to prison, of all the prisoners that were there, amen, some, I mean, we know that there were some there that were the butler and the baker and one was justly in prison, one was unjustly imprisoned. So who, who knows what situations he found, but no doubt what kind of attitudes and temperaments and sourness and, oh, I don't know, you, you can only imagine what was in that prison. But there was something about Joseph that made him different to the keeper of the prison than any of the other prisoners. And, and it wasn't his sour attitude, it wasn't his hatefulness, it wasn't his disrespect for the guard. Like, he didn't feel justified in, in being short-tempered and short-fused with the guard because he was unjustly treated. We justify so much horrible conduct. We self-justify so many things that should never come out of our mouth. We justify it because of hurt, because I'm offended, they hurt me, they, they shouldn't have treated me this way. I shouldn't be in this prison. I shouldn't be treated this way. And we, we'd start to justify our short fuse, our, our bad temperament, our nasty attitudes. There's no justification for it, no matter what happens. So something was different about Joseph, and, and that brought him to the attention of the guard. And the, and the keeper of the prison gave him authority until all of a sudden, amen, Joseph... Listen, Joseph wasn't an angry, contentious, bitter human being, or he would not have been given charge of the entire prison. And you know, we look back and read the Bible and we see everything is so perfect. It's perfect, it's the perfect plan of God. Everything worked out perfect. <clears throat> but while they were living it, it didn't look so perfect. I would assure you, that Joseph wasn't thinking, ah, oh, yes, this is perfect. I'm going down to Egypt because I gotta go to Egypt to save my brethren. I mean, years from now, there's gonna be a famine and years from now, they're gonna need me to be at the right hand of Pharaoh and ah, oh, I can see it perfect. How many trials have we been through when God upset our world and totally, totally rocked our world and changed everything and we were so disappointed and so discouraged and then years later you look back and say, that was absolutely perfect. God knew exactly what he was doing. I lost that job and I loved that job and I wanted that job and they let it go. But now, years later, you can look back and say, that was the hand of God. But you didn't know it the day you lost your job. You didn't know it when you were going through the trial. You can only look back and see it. And God was working a plan all the time in your life. And he knew you would hit disappointment. You would hit discouragement. Amen. But as a son of God, you've got to stand up and say, God, I trust you in every decision you make. And if this is not of you, I trust that you'll change this situation. So now Joseph is is now in prison and, and then there's two men, a butler and a baker, and they, they have dreams and he interprets the dreams and the interpretation comes to pass and he tells the one, when you're restored, don't forget me, buddy. Like, please, say a good word. To, he said, I'll never forget you. You're my bud and you, 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 you gave me the interpretation of the dream, it's coming to pass. And as soon as he got out of prison, he forgot Joseph. Question is, how would you feel? Would you go that butler, baker, I don't remember which one it was. After all I did for him and I was good to him and he forgot about me? Now, if you never had that thought, you'd come to perfection already. And you'd probably die and go to heaven because you don't need any more time on earth. Those things roll around in our head, but we need the Spirit of God Amen. to correct that human side. Sometimes we just need to remind ourselves who's in control. That God never fell off his throne and bumped his head and got amnesia. He's in absolute control. He's still seated at the head of everything. And he hasn't forgot me, and he hasn't forgot where I'm at. 
And, he, and he's not unmindful of what I'm going through. Sometimes we just need to rehearse these things to ourselves to keep us in the right frame of mind. So Joseph now is forgotten, and he's still in prison. God knew that this man, in order to fulfill the vision, had to know how to rule and reign. So he started training them in Potiphar's house. You know what he would have picked up in Potiphar's house? Potiphar was an Egyptian. The Bible's careful to tell us he was an Egyptian. And he was at a captain in the guard. Do you know what he would have picked up in Potiphar's house? Egyptian culture, Egyptian customers, customs, Egyptian politics. Because he was in the house of a high-ranking official. He would have figured out quickly how things work in Egypt. You know what he would have picked up in prison? All the gossip from the king's palace because the, the prison he went to was the one where they keep all the king's prisoners. So he would have picked up all the political undercurrents. That was the best training he could have ever had to ascend to the right hand of Pharaoh. He had seen it on both sides. He had heard it from both sides. And in both places, he was given responsibility as a ruler to rule and reign and guide and be in control of people. And God was absolutely working an absolute beautiful plan. It was probably more perfect than we could imagine. He probably overheard things in that cell and that prison that saved him trouble when he got to the throne. I don't know. I, but can you imagine? So... God's plan was absolutely perfect. Amen. And God's going to work his plan in us. He's going to have a perfect plan. And he's going to work it in our lives. And he's doing the same things with us today. Amen. You have to believe that. He's doing the same things with us today. He's bringing us in an ordained plan. He's bringing us an ordained way because he has a goal in mind. He has an objective in mind. And he's trying to bring us into Christ-like character. So why? So that we can rule and reign with him. And in so doing, he's got to put us in places and in situations where we have to learn how to handle situations and we have to hear things and experience things and see things that we didn't want to hear and we didn't want to experience and we didn't want to see. Because we would, if we planned our lives, my life would be so cream puff, cake eating, sweet as honey every day of my life, I would never learn anything. If I got to pick... I'm glad he doesn't let me pick because, I mean, I'd still be a little baby on the floor kicking and screaming every time he didn't answer my prayer immediately. I'd be throwing a two-year-old temper tantrum. So God, in his abundant goodness and grace, he's got an objective in mind. And everything's moving to that objective. And faith in that is what gives us the right attitude in the midst of trials. Listen, we can't get bitter because it's better for them than it is for me. We can't get bitter because somebody else's situation, it looks like God blessed them and he didn't bless me. God's got something else for them than he has for you. He didn't make a mistake. You know what happens when we get bitter about that? Now we never go around saying, I'm bitter because I'm envious. We, would, we don't say that. We're Christians. We know better. But that's actually what happens. So we don't, that doesn't come out of our mouth. And we don't even let that float around in our mind. We cover that up with some other excuse. I mean, we play mental gymnastics with ourselves all the time. But, but what happens when we do that? And we begin to compare our life with somebody else and we feel mistreated or left out or somehow forgotten. Or Really, the accusation is against God. When it gets really down to the nitty gritty, our accusation is really against God. Because God's in control. 
And we may think we're directing it towards somebody who's harmed us and somebody who's hurt us. And, but really, what we're doing is saying, God, you've not done a very good job of taking care of me because I'm hurt and I'm wounded and I'm negatively affected and now I'm justified in my bitterness and I'm justified in my nasty attitude and I'm justified at being angry with everybody and always in a fight. Instead of just being honest and saying, God, I'm destroyed, but I need your help. I don't understand why these things have happened in my life. I don't understand why everything seems to work out for others, but it never works out for me. But one thing I know is before the foundation of the world, I was a thought in your mind, and you know what you're doing, and forgive me for my attitude. Come and let your grace be sufficient for me. Sometimes we've got to get down and be honest and not just keep pretending we're okay when we're not okay. We need to say, God, I'm not okay. I'm, I'm bitter, I'm angry, I, I have self-pity, amen, I feel sorry for myself, and Lord, what I need you to do is come down and give me the faith to recognize that every step I take, you're aware of, you know about it, there's a definite purpose in my life, and you're going to bring me to an expected end. You have thoughts for me of good and not of evil. Right? These are the scriptures that concern the elect of God. We need to rehearse these when bad things happen to us. Amen. We believe it when good things happen, but we have to rehearse it when the bad things happen. When sickness comes, when trials come, when we lose loved ones we didn't expect to lose. What are we going to do? These are, these are the things of life that are there to mold us and put character into us. They're to equip us to rule and reign. Yes. Amen. When people walk away from the message we never thought would leave, when people forsake us that you never thought would forsake us, when we're evilly spoken of, when we're accused of things we haven't done, when we do wrong things and have wrong results, all of these things, we have to come back to the reality. God, you know the way that I take. And when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. Why? Because that was his plan all along. Nothing has changed his plan. Let's turn to Acts 14 together. I want to read through a couple scriptures and look at something here in the, in the word before we leave. Acts 14, 21. <clears throat> it says, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So how do we enter into the kingdom of God? Through much tribulation. So that should be our expectation. This word tribulation is a Greek word, and I won't even try to pronounce it, but the definition that it gives at the bottom is a pressing. Pressing together, pressure, oppression, affliction, tribulation, distress, or straits. So what, how must we enter into the kingdom of God? Through pressure, through oppression, affliction, tribulation, distress, straits. What is it? The whole world caving in on you. Things going wrong, pressures coming, troubles and trials and tri well, This is how we enter into the kingdom. I wanna look at uh, uh, just a couple more places here. Let's go to Romans chapter five. We'll turn quickly to a couple scriptures. Romans chapter five, verse one. Five and one, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. 
And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. This word tribulation is the same one we just went through in the previous verse. Oppress, anguish, tribulation. And by tribulation, we glory in tribulation, because tribulation worketh patience. Let's go to James chapter 1 quickly. James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I hope we can see by the scriptures that trials and tribulations and pressures and squeezes, they're just a part of life. There's no way to avoid them. In fact, the constant attempt to avoid them and then the mental distress and the the anger and the frustration we have by not avoiding them is actually causing us more trouble than the trial itself. Sometimes what we need to do is just put our head down like a mule and plow. We'll be done with it before we can quit fussing. It'll be over with and we'll be on the other side of the trial. Amen. And we won't get on the other side of the trial with all of the regrets and all of the repentance and all of the having to make things right for what we said and did to our family members and those that were around us. We won't have to go make things right with our coworkers. We won't have to, if we would just sometimes just put our head down and just plow and say, God, you know what's best. And when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. You know what's right. You know what's wrong. You know what's being said right. You know what's being said wrong. You know what's being done right. You know what's being done wrong. And I trust you, who's the righteous judge of all heaven and earth, to judge righteously for my case right now. And if you see fit to allow this to happen to me, then this is the direction that I want to take. Sometimes we become our own advocate. And we forget we have an advocate. In the message, the world is falling apart, Brother Bram says, we want everything just, everything so we can take it easy and retire and take life easy. If that's ever been a true statement, that's a true statement for me. You you know what I want to do? I want to become a professional fisherman. (laughs) But not one that actually has to catch fish to keep his profession. Like, I just want to go try and get paid. This is what he says, everything, we want everything so we can take it easy and retire and take life easy. He said life wasn't intended to be easy. Life is a struggle. Anything that's got life is a struggle. Look at the trees, how they struggle. Look at everything that's got life, it's a struggle. And when we try to get some kind of system that takes it easy, then we're wrong. And we know that there's something wrong. You know, we paint the American dream. You work hard for 30 years, you save for retirement and blah, blah, blah. Then you retire, you golf every day and the sun's always shining and nothing in your house breaks. (laughs) Because you're not working now, so everything's fine. You know what, it's a carrot on a stick. You work all your life, work, 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 save, 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 save. And and say you do get enough amount of money that you don't have to go to work anymore. That won't give you good health. That also won't give you a good solid family. That also won't end any of your troubles. It's the carrot on the stick. When there's going to be struggles and suffers all along, before retirement, during retirement, Post-retirement, when you have to go back to work because it wasn't like what you thought it was. You're going to have struggles all along. You get enough money that money's not a struggle, you have struggles with your health. If you don't have struggles with your health, you have struggles with your family. If you don't have struggles with your family, you have struggles at church. There's going to be a struggle. Might as well resolve ourselves to struggle well. 
to do a good job in the struggle, to be like Joseph, amen, and not like Cain. Cain killed his brother, amen. Cain did unrighteous and he killed his brother. And when God came to, to correct him on it, he started fussing about the correction and feeling sorry for himself and having self-pity and got angry and contentious with Almighty God. When he was, God was being so merciful to let him survive. And then to put a mark upon him that nobody would kill him. And he, he, he's contentious and he's angry and he's bitter and he's lying to God. I don't want to be like Cain. I want to be like Joseph. I want to be like Jesus. Job said in Job 14.1, he said, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Guess what? Your retirement plan is not going to change that. Nothing's going to change that. Amen. That's life. You know what will change that? New heavens and new earth. Amen. And we're destined for that. Yes. So praise God. Yeah. Let's go to John 16 together. John 16. And let's go to verse 33. John 16 and 33. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. Listen, if Jesus said it, it's a promise, just the same promise as I'll be with you Amen. until the end of the world. Amen. So you can bank on it. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, this word tribulation is the same one that we've been looking at in the previous two verses, oppressing, a pressure, oppression, affliction, tribulation, distress, straits. Now, let's go to Matthew 7, and we're going to see the word again, only it's translated differently. But I want to see it in its application here. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. We're going to read verse 13 and 14 of Matthew chapter 7. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. It says straight is the gate, and narrow is the way. That word straight just means narrow. So when I looked up straight and it said narrow, I said, well, why would it say Narrow is the gate and narrow is the way. Well, this word narrow, most every other time in the Bible, is translated tribulation. And in the previous three verses we read, when Jesus said, in this life you shall have tribulation, this, is a, this isn't the same word, this is the root of that word or the verb of that word. With, it comes from the same word. And here's what it means. Narrow, to press as grapes. Press hard upon to compress, to con be contracted, metaphorically to trouble, to afflict, to distress. So straight is the gate and narrow, this kind of narrow, is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Why are there few that find it? Because there's so many that don't want to go the way of press, affliction. They don't want to be squeezed like the grapes. They don't want to be pressed hard upon. They don't, want to, they don't want to be contracted. They don't want the metaphorical meaning of to trouble, to afflict, or to distress. So they try to take the wide way to bypass this way, but this is the way to life. You enter into the kingdom through much tribulation. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth into life, and few that be, there be that find it. Why? Because there's very few that says, Lord, is this the way I have to walk? Amen. To get to you, then that's the way I'm going to walk. That's the way I want to walk. There's very few that have a resolve to suffer. In, in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, when we know the story of the fiery furnace and the three Hebrew children, but I love what they said. They, 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 were, they were nice to the king. They said, oh, king, live, live forever. We can't, we can't do what you say. And our God is more than able to deliver us, and he will deliver us out of your hand. But even if he doesn't, will not bow. You know what? They had a resolve to suffer. 
They were willing to go through the fiery furnace to stay with the word, but they weren't getting bitter, angry. They weren't spitting a, 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 a insults towards the king. They weren't saying, you wait till God gets you for what you're doing. No. None of that. They conducted themselves as sons of the king. And we know that God delivered them. In the church age book, Brother Benham makes this statement. And he, he, he says, there is a gold of God. He goes from 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth. He said, the gold of God is a Christ-like character produced in the fiery furnace of affliction. That is the right kind of gold. But what kind of gold does the church have today? It has but the worldly gold that will perish. It is rich. It is complacent. It has made affluence and the, the major criterion of spirituality, the evidence of God's blessing and the correctness of doctrine is now based upon how many rich folks are involved in it. You did better come before it's too late, saith the Lord, and buy of me gold tried in the fire, and then you will be truly rich. Are we getting it? Listen to me. Naked physically we came into the world, but naked spiritually we will not leave it. Oh no, we are going to take something with us. What that something is, is all we can take with us. Nothing less, nothing more. So we had better be real careful now to see that we take something that will make us right before God. So then what will we take with us? We will take our character, brother. That is what we will take with us. Now what kind of ter- character will you take with you? Will it, be, will it be his whose character was molded by suffering in the fiery furnace of affliction? Or will it be the softness of this characterless Laodicean people? It is up to each one of us, for in that day every man will bear his own burden. What kind of character do you want to take? The characterless Laodicean? That's what we're immersed in. No one wants to suffer. No one thinks they should suffer. Politicians stay in their position by removing everyone's suffering. Until no one suffer, and now when no one suffer, everybody's suffering. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Because nobody wants to suffer. And the message I know, Brother Ben says, why does God let troubles come? God harnesses trouble. Many of you, I've told this for years, you know this, I've quoted this from this pulpit many, many times. This is probably my favorite quote in all the message. Why does God let troubles come? God harnesses trouble, puts bits in its mouth, and makes it obey him. And those troubles bring us into a closer fellowship with God. How many times have we prayed for a closer walk with God? He said, there had been no rainbow until the flood came. But after Noah was pressed into that condition that he was in to float 40 days and nights in a storm, the little ark pitching up and down in the water, it was after the flood was over that he saw the rainbow for its first time the covenant of hope, the covenant of promise. After he'd went through the tribulation, then he saw the promise. That's the way you see the promise after you've gone through the tribulation. I've liked that poem or psalm, must I be carried home to heaven on a flowery bed of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas. And this is the part that's my favorite. We ask for comfort and peace. God gives us the best he could give us, trials and tribulations. That's better than comfort and peace. Our comfort is just beyond the river. Why are we going through the troubles? To have the character when we get beyond the river. Our comfort is just beyond the river. I think we need to stop expecting paradise here and start looking for paradise there. America's falling apart. I mean, it's been falling apart. Brother Ram told us it was falling apart. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's rapidly falling apart right before our eyes. There is no security in finances. There is no security in government. There's no security anywhere. There's only security in Christ. It's going, I mean, what happens if we lose it all tomorrow? Well, if we lose everything tomorrow, I've lost nothing. Because we've been placing treasures in heaven where neither moth does corrupt or rust does corrupt. Amen. Our treasures, our comforts are just beyond the river and nothing can be lost there. 
And if I've got to pass through a little difficult time here to get there, then, then so be it. God's got a purpose in it, and I need to gain some more character. Amen. I want to. I want to finish. Well, I want to read two more verses. If I can read two more as we close, let's go to Hebrews thirteen. Hebrews thirteen. I want to read this and then one more scripture. Hebrews thirteen twelve. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. Wherefore, Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. That means willing to suffer for his name. Bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. There's nothing here for us if we lose it all. We have no continuing city. Let's go over to 1 Peter. Just a few books over to the right. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5 and 10. But the God of all grace who hath called us into his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, established, strengthen, settle you. When? After you've suffered a while. <laughs> I want to be, I want to be perfect, established, strengthened, settled. You'll get there after you've suffered a while. Because <laughs> that's the plan. I say, God help us. I believe we're in the age of adoption. You know, Jesus went to Gethsemane after adoption, after Mount Transfiguration. Is that right? So even in the age of adoption, we have to learn to resolve ourselves to suffer, to give in to the will of God, to keep the right attitude, the right approach, the right focus. There's a certain maturity that the bride has got to come to. And we cannot be throwing temper tantrums when we hit trials. There's going to be a people on this earth that's going to reflect his character. And it's not that they're not going to have distress because after adoption, he came into anguish of spirit. He came into sore, he was sorely distressed. He prayed in anguish until he sweated, as it were, great drops of blood. It wasn't that he didn't have anxiety and he didn't have pressure and he didn't feel the pressure and he didn't have great distress. He had all of that. But what he did with it and the way he reacted to it is showing what an adopted son of God acts like. It's not that we don't come to the end of our wits. It's not that we don't come to a trial that's beyond our ability. It's not that we don't, we don't ask God to remove the situation and change it for us. It's not that we don't have great anguish and severe sorrow and are so perplexed and so disturbed and so distressed that we have no idea what to do. We, we've hit that many times. We hit it many more times. But what we need to do is exactly what Jesus did and say, God, let this cup pass. Please rescue me from this situation. But if not, thy will be done, not my will be done, and give me the grace to stand up to it, Lord. Let me act like your son in the midst of this trial. I so want to be able to reflect that life in my life. Uh, God is going to have a victory on this earth. He absolutely is going. And, And Brother Branham said, His life in her is his victory. The resurrected life in the bride is the purpose for his death, and it's his victory. So he is going to have victory on this earth. And where is he going to have victory? He's going to have it in his bride. And how is he going to have it? She's going to reflect his life. I say, God, you can start right here. I need an extra dose of your help. 
I need an extra dose of your grace that is sufficient for me. I need that same sufficient grace that was sufficient to carry Paul. I need that same sufficient grace, sufficient enough to carry me because I'm failing in my own strength, but I can never fail in your strength for when I'm weak, your strength is made perfect in my weakness. Sometimes we just need to be resolved to go through the trial. Stop fussing. Stop complaining. Stop blaming. Stop conniving. Stop manipulating. And just start walking. I think for us, I think if we're able to take that attitude and approach, I think we'll be surprised at how quickly we come through a trial. And I think we might be surprised at how it was so much easier than we thought. Why? Because with that attitude and with that resolve, it's not you walking through the trial, it's his grace that's sufficient for you. It's not like you get to the end of the trial and say, that was easy. Then you get to the trial and you say, thank you, God. You carried me through. And it was so much better than I expected. It was so much different than what I anticipated. I had dread and I had anguish, but when I surrendered, your grace was sufficient and your strength was made perfect in my weakness and I come through the trial and, and I, Lord, Lord help us, I wanna come to the place where I quit causing myself extra trouble in my trouble. I have caused myself so much stress so much depression, so much anger and frustration, and so much regrets. Why? Because of me. It wasn't the trial. It was me. It was my reaction to the trial. It was my attitude towards the trial. It was the things I said and the things I did. And that I caused myself more trouble than the trial was actually going to cause me. You know what I want? The next time he hands me a multiplication table... I just want to start working on it. Instead of looking around the room and seeing if everybody else is mad like I'm mad. See if anybody else agrees with me that this is unfair. How much energy do we exert? Wasting time instead of just getting down to business. Say, God, help me. Next time you give me a 10-page research paper, I just want to start writing down the outline. Page one. Not fight it, not resist it, not blame anybody, not get bitter or angry. But God, make your grace sufficient for me. And in my weakness, would your strength be made perfect? I'm moving forward, Lord. Would you help me? I think you'll find with that attitude, you'll never pass through a trial alone. There'll be somebody with you. Let's all stand. Musicians, if you'll come, and Brother Blake, if you'll please come. I don't know when I'll finally grow up spiritually. But I know if I'm, on, if I'm here at the time of the body change, he'll see to it that I am. I don't know when it will happen and I don't know what it'll look like. But I know one thing, I'm not what I was. And what, what, what is it that has changed all of us from what we, are, what we were to what we are now? It's the word of God. But you know what's made that word real? our trials and tribulations. You know what's made the word so relevant and so real and so pertinent? is because of the things that we went through. The word of God has changed us and our trials have shaped us. And I say, thank you, God. And if that's what it took to get here, I wonder what it will take to finish the job. Probably retirement. I don't think so. I don't think it takes more of the same. Maybe a lot more of the same. 
Maybe a degree which we haven't faced yet. But praise God, he will have his victory on this earth. And he will have it in human flesh. And he will have it in a fallen, redeemed human flesh that is called his bride. And it will be the many-membered bride of Jesus Christ. And she will stand the trial. She will go like Jesus did, silent to the slaughter. Not defending herself, not manipulating, not blaming, not ridiculing, but just silently walking forward with confidence that my Father knows the way that I take, and when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. Praise God. God bless you all. Let's bow our heads together and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you, Father. For God, we need you, Lord, now more than ever. God, we're realizing more and more, Lord, how childish and foolish we've been. And God, we realize that if it wasn't for you, Lord, we would have never made it one step. Not one step towards your kingdom could we have made on our own. Not one thing could we accomplish, Lord, without your spirit. If it wasn't for your predestinated plan, for your drawing and wooing, for the word that you've given in this hour to mold us and shape us, we would have never made it this far. God, I pray that you would give us a determination, Lord, to give you first place and preeminence in every way. God, you surely know the way that we take. You've had thoughts of us from before the foundation of the world, thoughts of good and not of evil to bring us to an expected end. You've had a desire that you want to accomplish in our lives. And Lord, you've given us a revelation of your of your great plan. Help us, God, to surrender in a greater way than we've ever surrendered. Help us to give up our lives more than we've ever given them up before. Help me, God. Help me to surrender. Help me to yield to your tender hand. You're the potter, and I'm the clay. When you apply pressure, Lord, It's because you're trying to bring another characteristic, another trait out of this lump of clay. You've got something in mind and help me not to resist your hand, to resist the pressure. But help me, Lord, just to yield to you and allow you to have your way in my life. God, I pray for myself and for everyone that hears the sound of my voice, Lord, that you would give us the grace that's sufficient for our trials. That your strength would be perfect in our weaknesses. That we would glory then, Lord, in the thing that you're accomplishing. When we're not able, you are. When we can't, you can. When we're lost, you know the way. When we're blind, you can see. Help us, Lord, to just put our hand in yours and trust you as you lead us through. For, Lord, you're the good shepherd. And though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll not fear, for thou art with me. You're the shepherd that leadeth us all along the way. You go before us and bid us come, even through trials. Even if we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with us. Help us not to fear. Help us not to lose our faith. Lord, help us not to lose our understanding. But God, all that you've given to us, may it strengthen us and equip us for the things that we face next. And may we do so, Lord, by bringing glory and honor to your name. May you be magnified. May your strength be made perfect. May you get all the glory in all of it, we pray. Pray that you bless us and that you would help us, that you would forgive us for where we failed, that you would strengthen us with your might in the inner man. Help us to live the life you've always ordained for us to live. God, I want to live like Joseph, sold in slavery to the slavery of hybridization in this world. He never asked to be sold. He was just sold. We never asked to be sold, but we've been sold into slavery by Adam. Help us not be bitter, angry, Help us, Lord, to just shine as a light wherever you place us. To surrender to your great plan, for your plan is perfect. 
May we live a life like Joseph. May we live a life like you displayed, Lord, when you walk this earth. Lord, I pray you have your way in me. Bring us, Lord, to a greater maturity than what we have now. We ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. For whatever it takes to draw closer to you, Lord, that's what I'll be willing to do. And whatever it takes.
will I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength but sometimes
way.